how do we factor in um, the increasing degree of foreign sourcing when we're evaluating the potential cost of a system? Uh, Mr. Congressman, I, the short answer is I'm, I'm not aware where it is, and so I'm not, I, I don't uh, work at that level. We'd have to get back to you on that. I don't know to what extent it, it works into the cost estimates. I defer to you if you have a better idea. I would say that um, the trade-off should be made that it is, is cost-effective for the program. I am not aware of any of the root cause analyses that are looking at the cost growth. I am not aware of this being raised as one of the potential sources of cost growth. I just saw um, a report come through, and I will have to get you more details, but it addressed looking at, it may be the Buy American report that's, that's due to you, but it's, it talked about, yes, we make the trade-offs, but, but often we get in return something from the country, in, and they look at the overall uh, economic effect. So I would have to get back to you on that. It, it is an issue that's raised. I am not aware of it being identified in, for example, the nunn mccurdy um, cost growth analysis. And we now have an organization, the Parker Organization, that looks at root cause analysis. I am not aware of that as being identified as a source of cost growth, but we can ask. Uh, in, the, uh, in the award process today, is there any factor, um, any ability to factor in uh, the amount of uh, supply sources coming uh, from domestic sources versus foreign sources in the award uh, process? Uh, or um, does, it w does it work inversely in that to the extent that more foreign sourcing can lead to lower price, the existing award process effectively creates an incentive for more foreign sourcing. Is there any ability to give um, uh, a, a, a bonus in the award process to companies that agree to do more domestic sourcing? I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that. I would, it would be, I just don't have the facts. I'm sorry. Mr. Roth? Uh, well, I would appreciate you getting back to me on this, uh, on this subject. I, I think um, a one-year jump in waivers to the Buy America uh, 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 provisions of 450 percent is something that should concern every member of Congress, especially as we seek to grow jobs here in the United States. We are spending more and more of our taxpayer dollars within the Department of Defense budget overseas. I think that there is a very strong argument that that can lead to the increased cost of acquisition for many of these products as you create a, a, a a, a source network that is much harder to track from the DoD perspective, and I, I would I would hope that we could have a conversation about this issue going forward, and we could talk uh, about um, the reasons and the root causes for an increasing amount of work being done overseas, and to the extent to which that is part of the problem that we're seeing within the overall acquisition costs. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, we ask unanimous consent that all members be given five days to submit uh, additional questions for the record. Uh, you may choose, Mr. Murphy, to, uh, to do just that. I think that is a good line of questioning along with that in the industrial base aspects of that. Um, any objection? No objection. Uh, we are not letting you off the hook, though. That's, uh, those are written questions that are coming. But uh, we do have a couple more questions. We will do another round for those that are interested in, in that. Um, Mr. Sullivan, I noticed one of the comments that the General Accountability o uh, Office has previously made, and you mentioned it again in this report, is that the Department of Defense should work to balance its weapons systems portfolio with available funding. So my question to Mr. Roth is, what do you determine as available funding, just whatever gets appropriated? No, we clearly, in, in any given fiscal year, I mean, we, we <coughs> operate within uh, well-defined fiscal controls. I mean, we first and foremost, uh, as we build the budgets, we work with the, whatever the current administration is to build a, a budget within the fiscal controls. They have in general fiscal controls. Well, I, I, who sets the fiscal controls? Well, we work, it's, it's work collaboratively we, uh, with the Office of Management and Budget, and ultimately the Office of Management and Budget at the behest of the White House sets those fiscal right. controls. Then, as you well know, the budgets come to the, come to the Congress and it goes through the appropriations process. I, mean, I, I make the point because I'm parroting a little bit of what uh, Secretary Gates said just the other day. This, this defense budget in this country has doubled, doubled in the last decade. Yes, sir. You know, the things like 11 aircraft carrier units out there, the next uh, country in competition with us has one. Mm -hmm. $11 billion a year to build those. So my, my real wondering is who determines what is available? We just keep building as long as we can get Congress to think it is a jobs program and keep appropriating, as Mr. Welch said on that. 
Uh, it goes back to Mr. Solomon's comment about leadership. Somebody's going to step forward, and I think Secretary Gates has been stepping forward. It's incumbent on Congress to, to kick in as well and start saying, you know, we have the defense uh, system that's so much larger than all of our allies and protagonists combined. At some point, you know, what are the other needs of the country on that? And I don't think it comes into your level on that, but it does come into Congress and the and executive office trying to decide what, what it is we're doing here uh, in terms of that. And then looking at those programs that have some of the deficiencies you've talked about here today and weeding out the ones that, uh, that aren't really relevant to today's uh, fighting systems and, and needs on that and, and moving forward and getting rid of those that just aren't working and being done right. So your testimony on that has, has been helpful on that. How do you assess affordability of a new program, Mr. Roth or Dr. Spruill, whichever? I mean, that's the other thing that they were talking about. You know, assess the affordability, and we know that's a little bit above your pay grade, and we've got responsibility for that with the White House. But how do you assess capabilities in, in the context of the overall Department of Defense spending? Well, and, and as you may be aware, we, we actually go through a very uh, systemic uh, structured process, the, as, as Mr. Sullivan alluded to, the planning, programming, budgeting, and evaluation, the so-called PBE process, where we first of all set up the strategic plan and we take a look in terms of what are the threats out there, what are the requirements out there, I mean, to, what do you need to resource. Uh, then we go into an extensive programming and budgeting process where we try to balance off uh, the needs between the various and sundry mission areas that we have, and we do, we look at where where you can manage risk and, and where you, you don't want to take additional risk and those types of things. And so, for better or worse, it's a fairly long, comprehensive, convoluted in many ways uh, process where you take a look and saying, okay, where, what are my needs in the tactical air community? What are my needs, you know, in the shipbuilding area? And within those fiscal controls, you try to get as balanced a program as you possibly can. Well, exclusive of uh, GAO's good work here, D does the department itself have a, a system where somebody raises a red flag at some point and, and says what GAO has said well before they say it, that, hey, look, uh, we've got a program that's way over schedule, way over budget. Uh, they're not following the protocols that we've set up in our own system. They're certainly not following the laws that Congress passed. You know, and let's start weeding these things out, or do you wait for, it seems like we're waiting all the time for GAO to come up with a report and then reacting, but no, I, I, I hope I, that's not the I case. I think Dr. Spruill can answer in two terms. We have a very a very well-documented acquisition process as well. But in terms of resources, again, uh, frankly, there's, there's competition virtually every, every day of the week, so to speak, in terms of, for resources. And so those programs that are underperforming, those programs that aren't meeting a need, are, frankly, are at risk uh, against those programs. Well, I, I wonder, I guess, because are. I don't see the, the decisions being made. I see the budget doubling. So it seems to me they're mm -hmm. all they're competing with each other and they're all at risk. So what do we do? We throw a little more money, we keep them all going. I hope that's changing. I think the Secretary has indicated that he's got a mind to change, but if we don't, uh, where does this thing go? You know, a, a, billion, a trillion dollars by uh, a couple of years from now? Could, could I jump in on yeah, affordability? Because sure, sure. I, I really you. think it's important. I think that, it, um, at least from the acquisition perspective, we try to do two things, and it's, it is recent um, initiatives and processes. But when programs start at system development, when they're coming to their milestone B, the certifications that the Congress has laid out for us, we must say that it is affordable, okay? So we look at the entire program. And what we did last year, um, at &L, along with the Comptroller and the CAPE folks, when we got to the program budget review, when we were developing the President's budget, we looked at all the programs that had come through the process and were new. We looked at were they funded as the service committed, the service must commit to fund when they go through uh, milestone B. Were they still funded like that in the program? If not, why not? And if not, were there changes that need to be made? So I think we are stepping down the affordability road. <coughs> and um, it's clear from what the Secretary said, there the budget will not continue to grow, and so we must make sure that we live within our means. And that means some programs will not get started. Some programs will have to, um, as demands change, will have to be terminated. Well, with the indulgence of Mr. Flake for one second, I, I, I think that's right as, as a statement. But then I look back at what the Secretary did. He, uh, he basically made his recommendations with respect to the Army's combat systems program. And that was smart. It was about 80, $87 billion on that. Uh, but all of a sudden, we look up and there's the portfolio growing again. They're going to reintroduce it under new names, new size programs. 
So here we go again. Is the $47 billion cost growth on this rate? Mr. Sullivan, you have any comments? Well, in fact, that's a good point because one of the things we're concerned with right now, and in fact, we testified uh, at, the, at the Armed Services Committees on this, is that that new, the brigade, the brigade combat team, the initial increment, after all this acquisition reform and everything else, it looks like the Army has made a decision uh, to commit to producing that increment before all the testing is complete. So that give, gave us great pause, and we testified to that. That was not a good signal to right. us. And I would hope, Dr. will give you great cries. I mean, I'm expecting to find the F-22 back at this pace. Uh, I mean, if the decision is made, $87 billion, this is work, and you should be hopping all over that when it starts coming up as little animals along the way for a little bit of money, but the same darn thing over again. But the con the, uh, Without the right procedures in place and, and on top of that. Yes, sir. The Army does have a need for the capability, um, and so we are trying to address it. We're trying to address it in, a in, in an affordable way. Um, I, would, I will have to go back and look in more detail, but um, it, it was clear that the FCS program was not started out under the uh, recommendations or the policies that GAO recommends. Um, and, um, but we still have to meet the need. And so there will be additional dollars spent in that area, hopefully not anywhere near what we were talking about in FCA. Well, is there any exercise where you look at the budget having doubled in the last several years uh, on this defense budget and you say, well, if that's a need and we determine that we're going to kill the program then bring it back to life, where else in the Department of Defense are we going to free up the money to do that? What else ought to die? And, and that, is, that is what the Secretary has challenged us to do as we develop the budget. It would be real nice if the challenge was you don't get the money for the new thing until we see something else fall off the table. And that may be the case. And I don't know what will fall off the table between now and the next budget that comes over. Well, hopefully it will fall off before we start spending the next amount of money for something else. Yeah. Mr. Flake. Uh, just, just a statement to echo what's been said there. I mean, we're talking about rules and regulations to implement process of acquisition, but it's new weapon systems or the failure to get rid of old ones that, that really, I mean, we're talking on the margins here, uh, all due respect. Uh, um, so and uh, it's not just this defense secretary who made these noises. Uh, the last one did as well. Uh, we heard the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I get it again. It was, it was the same secretary. I was just teasing <laughs> him on that. No, no. I'm, I'm just saying the one before him. Out of the previous administration, we heard from Secretary Rumsfeld some of these same noises, uh, but yet we've seen a doubling in the last couple of years, and I'm, that fault does not lie at your feet, uh, obviously. Um, we've got to make some decisions here, but, uh, but what the chairman said, uh, I mean, when we decide we're going to kill these systems, uh, we need to make sure that uh, they remain so. Anyway, thanks. Mr. Rios? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd just like to follow up on this issue of competition um, because one of the challenges that's faced by, I think, armed services and this committee, quite frankly, is access to information. Um, just yesterday there was an article in the paper about the Department of Defense not uh, giving access uh, to certain documentation and estimates that are being made uh, at the Department uh, for members of Congress to review. Um, you know, they, it's estimated that the alternate engine uh, by the Department of Defense uh, we'll need another $2.9 billion. Uh, what we're getting from the contractor is far, far less in terms of the estimate. It, it's difficult for us uh, to make decisions in terms of authorization and appropriation when we know that the Department isn't following its own guidelines in, in terms of waiving competition standards, when we know there hasn't been competition for major propulsion systems, and now we are being told by the Department that this Engaging in competition will cost us a tremendous amount of money, uh, yet we don't have the documentation to show that. And we are supposed to just take at face value uh, the Department's assertion that we should put competition aside in major weapons acquisition when we know that's not the policy of the Department overall. And so this, this is an ongoing challenge, I believe, uh, for us to uh, you know, do our job in terms of oversight when it comes to cost of weapon systems if access to information is held up by the department itself. And, and Mr. Roth and uh, whoever else, I'd like you to comment on that. 
I'd have to look. I'd, I'm not familiar with the specific request for information. I'll, I'd have to look into it. I, I would argue if we have a case, we should make our case, and I, I don't have any basic fundamental problem with that. But uh, in terms of your specific request for information, if you, if I can, let's get back to you because I'm not I'm not familiar with it. And I, and I'm not aware of it either. In fact, I thought we were sharing um, a lot everything that, that the Congress had asked us um, on the Joint Strike Fighter. So uh, I, th I would have to just go back and ask. Uh, <clears throat> the, the information that we received on, on that issue, what, it was difficult to get information, I think, mainly because the Department took a position that that that, that was no longer part of the budget. So they didn't have the numbers for that. They had excluded it. but. We worked with the program office a little bit. And uh, the other thing is the Joint Strike Fire program just went through a major uh, shakeup. So all of the buys, you know, the, the annual production buys and how they're going to buy the engines and everything changed quite a bit. So that was real shaky data as well. We eventually got what we thought we needed, but it was hard to get it. Can, can you speak a little bit, Mr. Sullivan, about your own assessment of uh, the Joint Strike Fighter and the competitive engine uh, over time and, and what you see as we move forward in, in terms of uh, the various scenarios that you've laid out in terms of cost savings over time? Well, well we, we've done studies for other committees at the House Armed Services and uh, asked us to look at that, and we can't say with any authority at all. We, I mean, we don't forecast the future. But what we did do was make some assumptions based on historical data, which was, I think you referred to earlier, the F-15, F-16, uh, when they infused competition into that. And given those assumptions, uh, you know, if we looked at what happened historically on that, we found it, um, uh, we found that it was possible to achieve um, enough savings through the life cycle to get a return on, on, on the investment for the comp competitive engine. And, and those savings occur because of the competition, and if there is a failure of the single engine, then obviously there's tremendous cost uh, associated if you don't have that competitive engine. The, s the savings that we um, assumed were as a result of having competition, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I would just quickly note that for those of us that uh, support the current policy and the administration's policy on a single source engine, um, we note that some of the costs are very hard uh, to estimate at this time to have two um, single source engines with all of the end use cost uh, to the operators um, is, is hard to evaluate at, at this time, and, um, but I think has real consequences for the ongoing um, uh, defense budget. Um, my question was just uh, back to my line of questioning on the true cost of acquisition, a quick one to Mr. Sullivan. Um, my contention is obviously that when we look at the cost of purchasing a weapons system or a product for the Defense Department that is, um, uh, has a, a heavy um, emphasis on foreign sourcing versus domestic sourcing, that there's a cost to that um, that is outside of the defense budget, that in the uh, additional cost to the government of unemployment benefits, the lost revenue that comes with foreign jobs rather than domestic jobs, that the true cost of acquisition when you're looking at a product that is made um, uh, in majority overseas um, is not seen within the confines of the defense budget. And so it's just a question, Mr. Sullivan, has GAO ever uh, undertaken an estimate of the overall holistic cost uh, to the government of the increased foreign sourcing within the DOD budget? Congressman, I just don't even know the answer to that, but we can, I can definitely take that back and get back to you on that, see if we do have anything it, along it seems, those lines. It, it, to the extent that it has not been done, it seems like uh, an analysis that is, that is long overdue, and I'd appreciate a further conversation on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Sullivan, one of the recommendations that you made going forward, observations that you made, was that it might make sense to set some limits on a reasonable length of time for developing a system. How would that happen? How would that be done? So, some of the things that we, we don't press this hard because it's, it's, 
it's, uh, would be taken as somewhat arbit arbitrary. But what we found when we did a lot of work in the commercial world and at some world-class technology firms is that they enforce a schedule. Uh, and they do it for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it limits uh, uh, the amount of time that people have to change requirements and things like that. Mm -hmm. Number two, it gets products to market quicker before the world changes. It gives some th uh, people a piece of time that's more manageable. And in terms of the department, we think that it would be good to operate within what the department calls its future year's defense plan, which is typically a five to six year plan, and fully fund the development of weapon systems in that plan. Uh, you know, typically what happens, you're talking earlier about why there's no control. A lot of times when programs are 10, 12 years long, the future year's defense plan plans the first five or six years of them, and then things start happening outside of those years. So that's, that would be a constraining mechanism, too. You know, what happens, last year we, we moved to uh, get rid of part of the um, intercontinental ballistic missile, the, the missile defense program was $188 uh, million, not a big item by terms of defense budget, but an item that the missile defense uh, agency didn't want, so they wanted to see it cut. The secretary wanted to see it cut. The White House wanted to see it cut. Everybody wanted to see it cut. And the argument in return for that was, oh, we've got all this money invested. And so some of it survived on that. So that my question was really, how do you avoid that? You're going to say, well, we program's done in five years or it, it gets cut. At the end of five years, aren't we going to hear back from everybody, well, look at all the money you put in for five years. How can you just end this thing? It's a good question. Uh, you know, I mean, that's why we move slowly with those kind, okay. kind of things. But if you keep the requirements uh, in line with what, you, what is doable in a five-year increment, which is what world-class right. firms do, you know, so one you of the key... stop it at that stage where it doesn't meet the requirement. That's yeah, what, uh, you know, the F-16 was built that way, as I mentioned earlier. One of the key premises of all of this is that you have to separate technology development mm -hmm. from product development. You can't be trying to invent technologies while you got the factory running. In essence, that's what the department has been doing for years. They've had F-22 was a technology product, and they had an, an entire army to feed in terms of factory going and suppliers going. So you, you just, it's all in the requirements setting, well, I think, is the answer. We continue to make that sin on um, missile defense, but we're going to do that over and over again. Uh, is there any contemplation going on within the department about setting uh, lengths of time, reasonable lengths of time on that? Is that something that's discussed? And It's been discussed more in the IT world um, than, than in the weapon systems world. Um, however, I think the department is very aware of the need to keep most of the development is within a five or six year period. There are some that are not. Um, I, I'm not aware of, um, it, it would be more that would be set at the beginning of the program, but I'm not aware of, except in the IT area, talking about limiting the, the time before, say, five years, three years, whatever, before you try to lay out a reasonable program. Um, obviously, once you lay out the program, you should stick to the program. You, your point is well taken, though, on MDA, because MDA, as a presidential directive back whenever it was started, was given its own rules. Okay. And it, it's kind of like a technology development program writ large. Well, it's the most ridiculous concept of the world, spiral development. Is it, yeah. It's just, it's yeah. Only we started, that's a series of 100 I'm areas. sorry, I didn't realize you were talking specifically about missile defense. No, no, we were not. So okay. Your answer was fine, yeah. but I think you make a good point. It's, it's yeah. a good point on that. Is there a plan to deal with the situation on, on the software deep, you know, and, and all of the additional lines that are always required on that? I, I see it noted by Mr. Sullivan. Um, I think we all recognize it as a problem as well or anything, but I'm not sure how we c get on top of that or if you have any ideas the department does on what we're going to do about that. Well, again, we would look to the, both the systems engineering folks, the new folks that we're bringing in as a result of WASARA and the developmental testers to get a handle on it up front. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue in, for the independent cost estimators. Um, they have developed databases, and they will bring in what they think is the best estimate. I'm not aware of any um, special emphasis. I know it, it's, it's an important component becoming a bigger component of most of the weapon systems, and therefore 
it requires a lot of attention, especially from the cost estimators and the scheduling folks. Thank you. Mr. Flake? Mr. Driehaus? I'll take one more shot, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I want to continue this discussion about the Joint Strike Fighter and the competitive engine because it's important. It's one of the most expensive systems uh, that we are funding right now. And by Pratt & Whitney's own estimate, the F-135, the design and development, has gone from $4.8 billion to $7.3 billion. That's without competition. We don't know what it will be next year or the year after that or the potential increases. We have a major manufacturer coming in that we've already invested billions in for an alternative engine that's now coming through with a fixed price so we know there won't be cost increases in the future. Yet the Department is aggressively trying to kill the very competition that we know has worked in the F-15 and the F-16. We have already learned these lessons by the Department's own standards we should be pursuing competition. When you look at the waiver requirements, it doesn't meet any of them in terms of the justification being made by the Department. So I'm continuing to struggle with this idea that while competition is good, almost across the board, we make major exceptions. And we make major exceptions when we know the weapon systems is already over cost significantly and we don't pursue competition. I need better justification for this from those in procurement that, that understand it. And so uh, I'd love to hear a, a reasonable explanation other than just short-term investment in competitive engine. Yeah, it's going to cost more in the short term because you're investing in two engines. But the idea is that over the long term, we will improve the, the competition, we will improve the engine, and we will reduce costs. Help me why this understand why this exception is being made in this specific case. Again, in this particular case, I'm going to have to defer to the contracting community. I, I hear you. Again, I, it's my understanding of the program and you, and you're, uh, that the projected savings would only take place if, in fact, you really had true competition throughout the life of the program. And, and that apparently uh, is not, that is problematic. That may or may not occur. Uh, but let me not get into areas that are outside my bailiwick. You've raised some, some legitimate contractual sorts of questions. I think the best course is let's, let's get back to you. To the extent we haven't provided you some of this information, we, in my humble view, we should. So to, to let it. it's, it's, I think, an issue that needs to be debated and needs to be sorted out. So. I believe we need to get back to you also. The, the uh, Department's argument about the upfront cost being real and concern about the saving, um, but we should share with you those numbers, and I don't have them off the top of my head, so we will have to get back to you on that. But is it safe to say that given that the primary contractor is already well over budget, that in the future we might expect them to continue to go over budget? Uh, I mean, isn't that a safe assumption? And that the whole idea of cost containment through competition is to disincentivize those cost overruns and to provide the competition so that those costs are held in check. I would not say that we expect them to have further cost overruns. The cost estimates that we're providing, that we provide for the budget and we're providing here for a Joint Strike Fighter our best estimates of the, the um, actual occurrence. So I would not expect additional cost growth. Um, one never knows, obviously, but the estimates we are giving are not showing additional cost growth. But Dr. Spruill, I, I assume that you would admit that this is a significant exception to the policy uh, of the Department of Defense through procurement uh, to encourage competition in, in major weapons acquisition. It was, it was a special consideration by the department to look at the costs and benefits along the business case line that Mr. Sullivan talks about, and the decision was that it was not cost effective and therefore they're going with a single engine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, not to jump onto your, um, your issue on that, but I, I know two things. One, I know we put the cost estimates in thinking they're not going to grow, but we only had $300 billion worth of 
uh, cost overgrowth in the last report that GEO did. And if we had got the information from the department, we'd know what it was more recently on that. Could, could uh, I say something about sure. that? A lot of that cost growth, um, and, and Mr. Sullivan and I do have, um, we arm wrestle over this periodically, um, that a lot of programs, we have 102 programs in our portfolio. Many of those programs are older programs that did have cost growth since their initial um, start. However, a lot of them are now performing very well. So to take that number and apply it to the department's uh, acquisition today um, may be just a little bit overly harsh. It might, but I, I remind you again, if we had had the information given to GAO that could give us that assessment of what it was last year, then we would be able to make that kind of measurement on that. And, and so it's not helpful to us to judge whether or not there's accuracy on that. I, I know there's good intentions. Um, can you tell me, uh, or Mr. Roth, or Dr. Spruill, what happened, what changed between February's budget rollout and now that the Secretary decided to make the, uh, the, sec the alternative engine an issue? I don't think this is a new issue. Uh, we made the same issue when we submitted the FY10 budget as well and, frankly, in previous budgets as well. We have not funded an alternative engine for the last five or six years. The program has lived. Uh, on congressional ads over the last five or six years. So the decision was made years ago. This is not a new position on the part of the department at all. Okay. Let me wrap up just by asking one question about personnel uh, on that. The, you've recognized it and you seem to be working on that. Uh, the rise in contractor work uh, shows a hollowing out of a capacity for management and oversight, which isn't just unique to the Department of Defense, it's the Department of State, it's a USAID. It's a lot of agencies down the line. Do you think we're on a glide path to correct that situation? How long do you think it will be before we have the inherently governmental functions back in-house uh, so that when we're looking at a contractor who otherwise wouldn't necessarily have any incentive uh, to be concerned about some of the things that the government, whose money it is, might be concerned about? How, what's the glide path there? Well, we have an initiative, as you know, to um, grow the acquisition workforce right. by 20,000 folks. 20, the, those are in sourcing to the department. They will be government folks. By when? In the next five years, over right. the fit-up period. Um, and we have already started that in 10, and we have made good progress. I, I, I'll quote a number. It's probably r wrong, but it was about four, four I believe, instead of four of the 20 would be uh, in the first uh, year. Um, and so we, we have been going through the, uh, the uh, jobs, looking at them, deciding which ones we can insource. Now, some of that we are insourcing from contra taking contractors that are doing the job today and no longer doing them with contractors. Others we are bringing in new people because, as you know, over the last 10 years we cut the acquisition workforce quite a bit and we believe we cut it too much. Right. So we have an active initiative. Now the department is also doing some insourcing beyond the acquisition workforce, but we are definitely um, looking to bring those inherently governmental functions in and at a reasonable rate. We didn't think t we could do 20,000. In, in a year, so it's over a five-year period. Do we have the workforce development capacity to get those people up to where they need to be on their skills and uh, Yes, and, and we have the level? Defense Acquisition University. We sent over a strategic plan for the human capital um, initiatives and plans for the acquisition workforce. I think it just came over a, a couple weeks ago. And so we have laid out a process. I happen to be the functional leader for the business portion of the acquisition workforce that's about 7,000 folks. Um, but we have, we have increased the training requirements and the experience requirements for those folks and we are moving people into and through that process so that they will be level three certified uh, acquisition professionals. Great. Good. Well, thank you all very, very much. I appreciate your testimony here today and your exchange of ideas. Uh, people will be submitting questions, I assume, within that five-day period, if you'd be kind enough to respond to those uh, when you can as well. Uh, this is helpful to us, and I, uh, I appreciate both the progress that's been made in the Department of Defense, the work of the General Accountability Office. So I see a number of people from both of those areas sitting behind. I want to thank them as well for their good work on this. It is good to see uh, people working together in this sense. Uh, you take what you can learn from GAO and advise on that, push back on them and arm wrestle with them if you have to. 
uh, to keep it in line on that or whatever. But the idea is that with the, what we've passed and what you've passed in the Department for new regulations, we have to get a grip on this, and we appreciate the guidance and the work. So thank you all very much. Meeting adjourned.